County Chamber members. I'm so glad to have this kind of turnout for this important event. I'm Betsy Alice. I'm the Executive Director of the Sheboygan County Chamber. I'd also like to thank Prevea. Prevea has now, for probably four years, sponsored our First Friday Forums. Uh, and this, even though it's on a Monday, is also a First Friday Forum. So we really appreciate their support, and I'd like to give them a round of applause. I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker, Senator Brown Johnson. And I'm going to just do an introduction. Unlike my usual character, I'm, I'm going to read some of this because I think it's kind of fun. Uh, kind of fun to reacquaint ourselves with this man and kind of where he came from and what his life's been like and all of those secrets that he never, oh no, sorry, I won't do that part. <laughs> Both of Ron's parents were born and raised on farms. Their work ethic and small town values were naturally passed along to their children. As a result, Ron has worked hard his whole life and he continues to do that. As a boy, he mowed lawns, shoveled snow, delivered papers, and caddy for a few extra bucks. At the age of 15, after he was a small child, he obtained his first tax-paying job as a dishwasher at a Walgreens grill. He rose quickly through the ranks to be the soda jerk, the fry cook, and finally, he was promoted to be the night manager, all before he reached the age of 16. That was within a year run. He gained early acceptance to the University of Minnesota, so he skipped his senior year of high school and worked full time while obtaining his degree in business and accounting. In 1977, after graduating with a BSB accounting degree, he married his wife Jane and started working as an accountant at Justin's. He also continued his education by enrolling in an MBA night program. In July of 1979, Ron and Jane moved to Oshkosh to start a business with Jane's brother. The company, Kapoor, began producing plastic sheet for packaging and printing applications. From operating the equipment to keeping the company's books and selling its products, Ron has been involved in every function of that business. It is this body of experience and private, sec private sector perspective that he now brings to the Senate on behalf of the businesses in our area as well. Ron went to Washington because he believes the federal government is bankrupting America. He thinks it is important for citizen legislators to ally with those who are facing that reality. Ron is chair of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee and also serves on the Budget, Foreign Relations and Commerce, Science and Transportation Committees. He resides in Oshkosh with his wife Jane. They have three children and two grandchildren. And now I want to welcome Senator Ron Johnson to the stage. basic premise that all work has value. 
And I remember they telling me, I don't care what, you, what somebody didn't like, from the lowest skill level to the highest skill level, probably the greatest compliment you can pay another human being was, that person's a really hard worker. And that's a, I think that's a value that I think we need to re-embrace in this country. I think we do this very well. Um, I really want to spend most of the time asking, answering questions. I did the Chamber and Oscars. I was scheduled for about, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes. Questions went on for about an hour and a half, so I know there's an awful lot of questions. So rather than have me yammer on, I'd rather, rather hop to that as soon as, as soon as possible. But I, I just have to thank the, the she, uh, Sheboygan County, the Economic Development Corporation, the business community here for being so involved in what I think is just a, a great example that uh, I'm hoping more people will pick up on and, and institute something like the Joseph Project in their communities. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of what the Joseph Project is, it's you know, it's really sprang out of the fact as I travel around for six years around the state of Wisconsin, uh, talking to manufacturers, not one of uh, these businesses could hire enough people. And you have all these high levels of unemployment uh, inside Milwaukee, inside Madison. And I was just racking my brain, you know, what can we do to connect people that want to turn their lives around with all this opportunity that's, that's uh, and by the way, a good thing manufacturing jobs produce great careers. But what can we do to connect those individuals? And through serendipity, met a wonderful man called Pastor Jerome Smith. He's, he's come up here, he's, he's spoken up in the Sheboygan area. But he's got a unique ability to identify people uh, in his church, the Greater Praise Church of God in Christ. People that, well, let's face it, these are formerly incarcerated, former alcohol drug abusers, or, or just people really down on their luck, hardcore unemployed. He's got a unique ability of identifying those individuals and finding out the ones that are willing to commit themselves to succeed. And we just go in for a week. Um, I sent a staff working with a bunch of, a lot of other people come in and do some training, three hours a day, four days a week. And the fifth day, then, individuals get interviews with companies, great companies here in Sheboygan. This is really where the test site was. Um, I'm not going to name them because I think you're aware, and I'll leave one out and they'll, they'll feel bad afterwards. But what's extraordinary about this program is, is a pastor, Jerome Smith, are the participants. I would say my staff members have really done just, just put their heart and soul into this thing. But the employers, the owners, the managers, the superintendents, the people on the shop floor, that not only have the participants dedicated themselves, committed themselves to, to succeeding, but every one of those people working in those businesses, they're taking a chance. And let's face it, they're taking a chance on folks from the inner city of Milwaukee. Every one of those people in those businesses, it's been my experience, as I've gone into those businesses, have also committed themselves to helping those individuals succeed. Which gets me back to what made this country great. You do. People in this room, people involved in, the, in these civic institutions, that care enough about their communities, care enough about their fellow human beings, to give it all to get involved. You know, look, I know it's a, a, a bipartisan crowd here. Let, let me just, you know, when I'm talking about Lincoln Day Dinners, I've, I've been closing it off, uh, talking a little bit about my campaign and kind of the commercials we ran to convey to folks in Wisconsin that, you know, we care about you. My final one was in front of my fireplace with the old <coughs> Flannel shirt on. I'm just going to paraphrase. I'm going to quote for you because we have serious challenges facing this nation. But you know what gives me hope? You do. Your prayers, your kindness, your hard work, and your courage. This is a great nation filled with wonderful people. But we do face enormous challenges. But the good news is, and it's demonstrated here today. We really do share the same goal. We all want a safe, prosperous, secure Wisconsin in America, and we are concerned about each other. It's not a bad place to start. So if we concentrate on those areas of agreement, as Wisconsinites, as Americans, if we stay involved in our communities, in our churches, in our civic organizations, things like Rotary, things like the Chamber, if we implement our compassion in our own communities, 
Stop relying on a very dysfunctional, ineffective, ineffective, broken federal government. You know, we outsource our compassion to the federal government. It hasn't worked out too well. It has mortgaged our children's future. But it hasn't solved it. We haven't won the war of poverty. We're going to win that war of poverty in our communities, working together through these types of organizations. So again, thank you. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for making Sheboygan County, the city of Sheboygan, the surrounding area, such a welcoming and compassionate county. You, know, you are turning lives around. I'll, I'll just end on a couple quotes from some of the Joseph Project participants. One reason a young man said, you know, my nine-year-old daughter is finally proud of me. Another one said, my parents are finally proud of me. One said, you know, I go to work, it's like heaven. Another one, I go to work, it's like family. Of course it is. Those of us that have had those types of opportunities to work in great companies realize all the value the work brings to our lives. You know, the mission statement of this country is combined what I always consider, what I always call the letter of intent of our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the, the Constitution, the contract. But the mission statement, as we've all heard it, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I love that. It's so obvious that all men are created equal. That we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, among those of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We do not achieve happiness dependent on anybody. We achieve happiness by earning your own success through the type of work opportunities that this county is providing some wonderful people who have committed to turn their lives around. There's the example. That's why I'm here primarily to thank you as a county, as a people, as a group of folks involved in this kind of organization. Thank you for your involvement. With that, I'll start taking questions. Anthony's fair game, sir. I have a deal with Mike Florner. How are we going to do this? So why, why don't you, to, to cut down the time, why don't you get the microphone in front of somebody for the next one? Okay, so then whoever's the next one up, just to start talking to Mike. We'll start here. Which one is this be? Right here, you just got a mic two seconds from me. There you go. Thank you. What do you anticipate? How will we resolve the health care issue that's out there right now? Sure. Well, I won't sugarcoat this. It was it was not it was unfortunate what happened in the house. Uh, my own idea is I've been talking about this for a number of years, and actually took a lot of heat from the right flank when I started talking about once Obamacare was implemented. You could, you could talk about repeal and replace, probably just implementation. But once implemented, a 380,000 word bill morphed into 20 million words of regulation and rules infiltrating every sector of our health insurance and health provider markets. Not so easy, you can't just snap your fingers. So what we should have been talking about doing, what should have directed our efforts is repairing and limiting the damage done by Obamacare the harm done to real people. That would be the skyrocketing premiums on the individual, in the individual insurance markets. It would be talking about reconnecting patients with doctors they knew and trusted. Had we focused on that, I think we would have produced a far better product out of the House and could have passed the House, hopefully passed the Senate on a bipartisan fashion. Again, I would say it's, it's just not smart to start a political discussion saying we're going to do this completely partisan. We're not even going to reach out to the other side. We should have focused on the damage done to real people. I think Democrats probably don't like the fact that you know individuals in their state have seen their premiums double and triple. They'd probably like to fix that as well. So you start the discussion in a more bipartisan fashion, finding those areas of agreement. So I'm hoping as we move forward, we will focus on that. It sounds like the House just offered an amendment talking about guaranteed issue. Now, I know how popular it is to cover people with pre-existing conditions. We can do that without collapsing the insurance markets. So guaranteed issue, let, let's apply it to auto insurance. If an auto insurance company had to sell you a policy as soon as you want one, anytime you want one, who in their right mind would buy auto insurance? They would tell you they crash. They go right and say, sign me up. Sure, I'll pay a 30% penalty. It collapses insurance markets, and we've known that. We knew it when it was passed. So the good news is you can actually cover people with pre-existing conditions. They have to take a little responsibility to remain insured with a subsidized insurance policy if they can't afford it. 
but using high-risk pools. Maine had guaranteed issue, it was collapsing the insurance market, they instituted an invisible high-risk pool, which is what the House passed. So I'm hoping you know, we learn something from the attempt in the House, the failed attempt, start focusing on the damage done. If we do it, and we do it right, and we give people real information, if we reach out to the other side, come on. There are, there are people really being harmed, and yes, we know there are people also benefiting from this. And we've all said we don't want to pull the rug out from under anybody. So let's acknowledge that fact. So let's not pull the rug out from under anybody, focus on the damage, try and fix the harm done. And I think there's probably a path forward, hopefully on a bipartisan fashion, a reform, a replacement that will actually last. Next. Who's got the mic? I scared everybody off. I mean, we can talk about, I mean, I, I can ruin your day. <laughs> there's, there's so many interesting things to talk about. As I said, I'm okay, Tristan here with Aurora. Um, currently in the state of Wisconsin, 47% of the people on Medicaid are children. They only make 9% of the cost. But we have, pediatricians in the state are very concerned that if we either block grant or cap Medicaid, shifting costs to the state, the state has no money, and at some point in the not too distant future, cuts to Medicaid would have to happen. And given that half the, half the kids, half the Medicaid recipients are kids, we're concerned that that will hurt kids in terms of the coverage they need or the medications they need. How do we, how do we protect children as we try to come to grips with the rising cost of Medicaid, which is mostly driven by uh, senior care, elder care, and elder care? But let me start out by asking this group a question. I've, I've asked this literally to tens of thousands of Wisconsinites. Show of hands. How many people here think the federal government is efficient and effective? I, I see one. No. So the federal government is efficient and effective. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, I've asked that question to tens of thousands of people, and I've literally only had a few dozen raise their hand. Most of the time, I get primarily what I got here is laughter and giggles and you know guffaws. You know, the fact of the matter is the federal government is not efficient or effective. It's pretty broken, it's dysfunctional. So I think long term, the best solution for uh, the social safety net is to turn it back over to states, turn it back over to communities. They'll be more efficient, effective with spending, to actually be able to design solutions uh, better tailored to their states or their localities. So I, I, we do need to understand that when we've outsourced our compassion to the federal government, you know, the war in poverty. We've spent somewhere, you know, depending on how you figure, 13 to 20 some trillion dollars on the war in poverty. Did it work? Did we alleviate poverty? I mean, basically, once the spending basically you know, started kicking in, poverty rates flatlined. Out of wedlock birth rates skyrocketed. Again, going back to you know what what really creates a cohesive society, the foundation building block of, of any society is a family. Is is busted apart. You know, I had some public health officials come in, like the same thing, asking, you know, hey, you know, I understand the reality. I know we've set up the system where the federal government's the big tax collector, and then we've got to beg for the money back to the states, pennies on the dollar, not a very sufficient system. Um, we've got to break that dynamic, but it's, I realize it's going to take time. Um, but that, to me, that's the solution, is start block, block grant is kind of the first step, but when you block grant, you also have to start turning back the taxing authority back to states and local governments. I, you know, because the one size all, you know, the one size fits all type of solution is not working on the federal government basis at all. And again, I, I just have a great deal of faith in communities realizing well, you know, we're, we're concerned about our kids. But part of the problem with all these federal government run social safety programs is. Are people's charitable now? When you realize, well, no, the federal government's going to take care of that. They're going to take care of those young people. You know, they're going to take care of the impoverished. I don't have to do anything because the federal government's going to do it. Well, who's the federal government? Us. And I would also point out the fact that we are currently $20 trillion in debt. That's about $62,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. And it's just begun. Over the next 30 years, CBO projects that it will be $103 trillion of additional deaths of spending. About $14 trillion of deaths in Social Security, $34 trillion in Medicare. The rest is more than $50 trillion of interest on the debt. So if we don't want to incur, by the way, 
I don't think that's possible. I, we're going to hit a wall, and if you think the economic damage of the bursting of the housing bubble is a problem, I'm not going to want to see the damage done by bursting the debt bubble, which occurs when the U.S. currency is no longer the world's reserve currency. And that's already happening. You're starting to see world trade occur in other denominations. When we're no longer a reserve currency, we become Greece. And a quick little sidelight, Greece's debt per capita is about half of what ours is. They just have the world's reserve currency. So I, I know I'm not solving your problem here in terms of how we take care of kids. I'm just suggesting that the federal government is probably the last place in the world we want to turn our health care system or really rely on to really take care of our kids. We ought to do that here in our own communities, our own states. And we got to set the process of devolving that power to get the tax authority back where government is a little, you know, government close to the government, where it is a little more efficient, a little more effective, and certainly more accountable. That'd be my suggestion. share my dismay that it takes something that is clearly prohibited, you know, chemical weapons, definitely a war crime, before the American, before the, the world kind of opens up its eyes to what has been a, a genocide <coughs> in the last five or six years in, in Syria. Uh, or a picture of a, of a, of a, what, a little three-year-old boy drowned trying to escape. Um, we should have been acting in Syria a long time ago. President Obama should have acted immediately, which was, by the way, my counsel and Samantha Powers called me up to talk about the chemical attack and how we absolutely knew that was coming from Syria. My counsel was, well, don't come to Congress. We'll take too long, you'll dither. You know, they'll move their assets straight down. You will have one United States Senator, I think a bunch of us, in support of your action. So I'm definitely supportive of what Trump did. But we need to understand that this slaughter will continue. And to me, if you're a mother and your child just died, does it really make a whole lot of difference whether it's through sarin gas or a barrel bomb or a precision guided missile directed into a hospital for humanitarian convoys? That's what's been happening. And we just turned our, we turned our face away from it. So the solution in Syria is ugly, but we first, we first need to defeat ISIS. Every day they've gone, they've continued to exist, they continue to inspire, they continue to train, problem once we defeat them is going to be bigger in terms of the diaspora of terrorists that are going to spread outside that system. So defeat ISIS, reclaim that territory. I think it needs, it'll need a stabilizing force of American boots on the ground. That's what's going to be required. We should have left them in Iraq in 2011. I don't think Syria would have spun out of control. We could have actually given ourselves the opportunity to show that Shia, Sunni, and Kurd could actually govern with coalition government. The only way that was going to work was with the stabilizing force of American boots on the ground. So if we do that, we reclaim that territory, defeat ISIS, now you change the conditions on the ground, maybe there's a negotiated settlement. Maybe we can get Russia's attention. By the way, I think Tillerson has been quite strong. And I think he will be quite strong when he meets with Putin later this week in saying that, well, Russia, Putin, you're either complicit in the use of chemical weapons by Assad, or you are completely incompetent in managing your client state, which is basically what Syria's become of, of Russia. I think that's exactly the kind of pressure you need to put on Putin. You know, Putin has no, no ability to stabilize the situation. All he can really do is provide this, this destabilizing actions in Ukraine, in Georgia, in Eastern Europe, in Syria, and around the world. We, we, we America and the West, you take, a, you take Western Europe and America, Europe, EU and, and America, we're about $34 trillion in economic strength, GDP. Russia's less than $2 trillion. Look who's pushing who around. We need to understand, really, who the big dog is. We need to lead. We need to strengthen our economy. We need to strengthen our military. But we need to lead with our values. That's what we need to do in the world. We've had eight-year hiatus from that. Trying to achieve peace through withdrawal has been a miserable failure. And we have to understand the events in Syria are not half a world away. They're land on our doorstep, either through migrants coming back in this country through visa waiver program, through our unsecured border. I don't know which way, you know, how we actually feel this, but maybe it's the collapse of nations, 
for certain the destabilization of the nations in Europe, which is not good for world peace and stability either. But again, this to me, Syria is in our national interest for a host of reasons, and we need to stabilize it. I don't think America can be the world's policeman, but when it is in our national interest and we have the ability to stabilize the situation, I think we have to because there's no other world leader. Senator, um, as you drove up today, you noticed that large body of water up there. Uh, we are bordering the Great Lakes, and we are one of the states, and even in one of the countries that makes that body of water the greatest resource in the world of natural fresh water. So, you know, and I know recently Congressman Grothman signed a letter to President Trump, um, and some other, I think our governor also came out and supported the Great Lakes Restoration Funds, trying to hold on to that money so that we can turn the corner on some of the issues that we've been facing, um, whether it's invasive species or algae blooms. Um, it's a $62 billion asset in terms of tourism um, to the states surrounding the Great Lakes. So just wondering where you are on this issue and, and whether um, you see some merit in trying to sustain that effort. Well, again, you know, unlike what I was talking about Medicaid, where I really think it should be done locally at the state level, I mean, the Great Lakes, first of all, it's interstate. It's also international. So I definitely see a federal role in achieving a goal we all share, which is a clean environment. So I, I have no problem from that standpoint. I, I, again, the, the House letter was a House letter and let the House handle that. From my standpoint, I do want to at least be sympathetic with what Trump is trying to do on the federal budget. I understand that Congress will work its will, and so many of these cuts probably won't occur, but I do want to be supportive of the attempt to start prioritizing spending. So from my standpoint, here's something, you know, the Great Lakes Initiative is obviously something that is international, interstate, and there's a real federal role, so that should be one of those priorities that should get funded. There are a lot of other priorities that shouldn't. And from my standpoint, coming from the business world, uh, you know, you got a business that has a downturn in sales in order to save itself. Businesses routinely go to their department and say, you got to cut 10, 20%. And businesses do it, and somehow they survive. The government needs to start looking at that kind of process as well. So I, I want to be supportive of Trump as he's really tabling these agencies and saying, you know, why don't you focus on your main objective here as opposed to what you metastasize into? Okay? Sir? You know, I'm a little concerned about the immigration program itself, or the lack of came from the old country. They went through El Sinai. They went through all the conditions that required them to be here. So when we use the terminology, immigrants is one thing. Illegal immigrants is something else. And I think it just annoys me that the government is playing games with and that we need something settled once and for all. And I don't know what your opinion, and you know, I hear about it a lot in the news. So it's just sort of an annoying thing to me, since like I say, my parents came to Ellis Island, and they didn't have all the extras that they give to the uh, illegals coming in. So it really concerns me a lot. So let's start by acknowledging the fact that we are a nation of immigrants. It's really made this country unique and strong. Every wave, every wave of immigrant coming to this country have come, oftentimes destitute, but willing to work their you-know-what's off in this land of unlimited opportunity. And there's really no difference, by and large, in terms of the, the, the recent waves coming in. So we need to recognize that fact, but we also need to recognize it needs to be a legal and controlled process. You know, one that really does require people to accept the premise of this nation, which is the rule of law and the Constitution, not, I'm, I'm sorry, not Sharia law, uh, not maintaining allegiance and loyalty to where they came from, not, not, not you know, giving up their culture, but certainly ending their allegiance to a different nation. If you've ever been to a, a naturalization ceremony, it's pretty sobering because they are asked to renounce their past loyalty and accept loyalty here. Uh, we ought to do everything we can to set up a legal system. You know, where we had the Bracera guest worker program in the 60s, we didn't have a problem with illegal immigration. We had circularity. Somebody from Mexico could come work the fields in California for two months, leave with a year's worth of salary, and go home. 
a lot of people would like to go home, but you know, we, we ended the guest worker program, we started securing the border, and now once they get in here, they don't want to take the risk of going back and not being able to get back in as porous as the border is. So from my standpoint, in order to fix this problem, which has been developing over decades, but one of the things I've done in hearings, we've held 23 hearings on this in my community. Uh, I've just laid out all the bills, all the piece of legislation that's going to fix this problem. Going back to the age of Reagan, when we had, I suppose about a million and a half, I think three and a half million people took advantage of the, the amnesty. Kept passing bill after bill after bill, and I name them off, and then I say, well, this is how many people are in this country legally. Three and a half, six, nine, ten, eleven. You know, we don't fix problems with legislation. The legislation sounds good, it just doesn't fix the problem. So we have to fix it, starting with committing ourselves to the border. We have an administration willing to do that. We'll do it intelligently. I've got a great deal of faith in Secretary General uh, Kelly. He's got his head screwed on. He just had a hearing on this yesterday. He said, the Senate, no, nobody's envisioning a wall from sea to shining sea. Not in his department. So we're talking about manpower, we're talking about technology, we're talking about better barriers where we need them. But once we have that commitment to secure our border, I think, because we're a compassionate society, we'll take care of the individuals here with humanity, the people that are working hard, aren't committing crimes, aren't feeding off our welfare system, now, criminals, the drug runners, the human sex traffickers, you know, the, the 17, 18 year old young men who raped repeatedly and brutally a 14 year old girl in Rockville, Maryland. Yeah, those people we need to get rid of or put in jail and keep and throw away the key. So we will prioritize who we deport, it'll be those criminals, and we've got to set up a legal system. I, I, would, I would be definitely in favor of a robust guest worker program. You know, tourism is important here. You know, my guests during the summer have a really hard time in the hospitality industry finding enough workers. You know, I was a big supporter of the J-1 visa. We, we, need, we need to recognize the fact that we don't have enough people doing a lot of these jobs. And I'll end on this note. One of the reasons we don't have enough people filling manufacturing jobs, I would say two reasons. One, we pay people not to work. We've got to fix our welfare system. We have to stop incentivizing people not to work. And we also tell all of our kids, you've got to get a four-year degree. We denigrate the trades. You know, some, somehow when we say that, it's, it's, it's basically saying, well, you know, ooh, factory work. You know, that's not, that's not for you. you got to get a four-year degree. you got to have a, a higher quality. Nothing could be further from the truth. All works have, has value. We need to reinstill that in our kids. Increased from 29 million to 47 million. 
Poverty rates have flatlined, and out of like birth rates have gone from about 8% to 41%. Not a real good metric. You know, let's start looking at information. Let's be honest enough with ourselves and courageous enough to look at reality and react to it. So that obviously includes scientific facts. I saw something else over here in the back there. Okay, go ahead. If you got a mic, just start talking. Senator, how do you see the federal government creating and enforcing legislation that will support small businesses in our states and cities while still keeping in mind our world economy and our trade alliances? So let me give a pitch for my, my tax proposal. Um, by the way, government doesn't create jobs. Government creates an environment that's attractive for risking. And right now, it's not a very attractive environment. We have a $2 trillion per year regulatory burden. We have uncompetitive tax system. So let, let me talk a little bit about taxes because this will really speak to small businesses. I, I came from, a, I would say, a medium-sized manufacturing company. What I've witnessed over the years, it's continued to happen, is a consolidation even within that industry. Partly, be, largely driven by the fact that you have double taxation dividends, so large corporations have an incentive for hoarding their cash. And what do they do with the cash? If they can't work organically grow, it's, it's hard to grow organically a business. So they start buying up their competition, they buy up their suppliers, they buy up their competitors, um, they buy up their customers. And you start consolidating industry, which is not good for free market competitive economic systems. So here, here's my two main proposals for taxes. I've been in Washington now for six years. I've had group after group come in begging for tax reform. You know, lower the rates for on the base, just don't touch. Oh, Lord, you, know, I mean, you name the preference. So I came to the conclusion pretty early on that you're just not going to be able to pass that kind of old-fashioned tax reform. So here's the good news. I don't think we have to. Why not make a new, elegantly simple system optional? In other words, if you like the 70,000 pages, all your preference, be my guest, keep it. Or you can choose to comply with an elegantly simple tax system. You can argue what that is, but I, mine would be cash-based, ability to pay. I had infinite smoothing within the progressive rate schedule. The rates would be dramatically lower because you get rid of all the social and economic engineering through the tax code. So that's the first thing. You've got to have a tax, tax simplification passable. That's the way you make it passable. Make it an option. Secondly, and this is, I think, the, the main driver of economic growth in answering your question. We know that the piece of paper that is the corporate charter doesn't pay the corporate tax. Employees and consumers pay the corporate tax. It's a self-inflicted wound. But you know how, how difficult Paul Ryan's having lowering the corporate tax to 20%. And he's got to pay for it with a board adjustment tax, which I don't think has any chance of passage. So rather than, and here's the next idea, rather than having employees and consumers pay the corporate tax, let's make the owners pay it. No, let's make Warren Buffett pay the tax. This would be a true Warren Buffett tax. You would trip the earnings to the owners and make them pay the tax. Now, it may sound a radical idea, but it's not. 81% of American businesses currently use that system. They're subject to the LLCs. They're past remedies. Make C Corps past remedies. The way you pay the tax, by the way, is just like payroll tax, those corporations would make a backup of holding to cover the tax to the federal government. Tax is basically paid. You know, end of story, except for kind of individual basis to figure out the, you know, if you have a lower rate, you might be able to claim a refund. It's getting scored. Hopefully, I'll have that scored by the end of the week. Now, what does that do? It ends the double taxation dividends, so companies no longer have that incentive to hoard cash. It'll free up capital. Everything left in that business, in terms of profit, is available for a tax-free cash distribution because it's already been taxed. It will end up allocating capital more efficiently throughout, the, throughout America, making it far more competitive, and those corporations will be the most competitive globally of any corporation on the planet. It's all, also, you also tax worldwide income. That's what we do with LLCs and subchapter S. You end the incentives for people parking cash overseas. There's a lot of good about this. Finally, the Wall Street Journal wrote about it. It's gaining some traction. Hopefully, we can get that done. But again, it's coming up with a common sense tax system, a simple tax system, reducing the regulatory burden. Now, President Trump said he's going to reduce the regulatory burden by 75%. I'd call that a stretch goal. But it does indicate where this administration is. You're not going to see that. This, by the way, what I completely attribute the Trump bump to is that recognition by this administration that regulations are out of control, and at least for four years, we'll have a pause, and we're going to stop over-regulating the economy. And that brings certainty 
to businesses, it creates a greater incentive to take risk. And that's, what you, that's all the government can do is bring certainty, uh, try and create incentives uh, that are already there in terms of profit mode with the free market competitive economy. Okay? Wherever. You guys got the mics. Senator Johnson, uh, what do you see as possible solutions for the student loan crises? Bring down the cost of college. I'm, 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 again, that, that, is, that is the root cause. The cost of college, higher education, because you have the higher education economic cartel, I'll call them. High, the cost of college has increased two and a half times rate of inflation since the 60s and 70s. So I'm asking people to think, you know, why? I mean, what's so different about what college and, and, and uh, universities spend their money on that their cost would increase two and a half times rate of inflation? Well, thankfully, we had the Federal Reserve Bank in New York do a study on this and said that for every dollar the federal government poured into higher education, tuition increased on average about 60%. If you do the math on that, by the way, it's about $2.1 trillion since the 70s. 60% of that's about $1.4 trillion. You know what the cost is, how, how much student loans are outstanding right now? $1.3 trillion. Now, back in a, a galaxy far, far away in my old life, in Oshkosh, when I was working in a volunteer based in the school system, one of the things we did in the Catholic school system was something we called the Academic Excellence Initiative. How do you teach more, better music? Basically, education and productivity. So back then, I typed into my Yahoo search, education and productivity. I did not misspell it. I get zero results. I mean, think about it. We are still operating on a 19th century education model here in the 21st century when we have the marvel of the information technology. We have things like massive online open courses. So we need to drive technology, productivity into education. You don't do that with higher educational cartel because it works really well for them. How do you do it? My own personal opinion, move away from a degree process to a certification process. Totally democratize education. In other words, I don't care how you learned it, how you got your education, your knowledge, but if you can pass a CPA exam, you are a CPA. Now, obviously you need so, you, know, you need things like clinicals for medical education, engineering, you need labs. All, again, there'll be some combination of it, but you need to open up ed higher education to competition. And I mean real competition. I mean competition from people who, for example, we're, we're, we're dealing with an individual who is a technologically dis is a technological disruptor. For example, in the buying and selling of stock. This individual, I'm not going to name him because he's not quite there yet, has, has educated probably about a half million people overseas, poor children in undeveloped countries, using video. Well, now he's working on a program to utilize information technology to bring that home to America and offer college education, truthfully, for a fraction, for a fraction of the cost. You know, utilizing information technology, utilizing the computer and how you learn, you know, sitting at a terminal, and it's not, by the way, it wouldn't be 100%. You're not always at the terminal, but you use that effectively. We can do a far better job at a lot lower cost. It's called, called productivity. The two areas of our economy, by the way, I would argue, that we're not satisfied with, healthcare and education are two areas of the economy where we've basically driven out the discipline of a free market competitive system. You know, higher, you know, K-12, we pretty well have the monopoly of teachers unions and public education. And healthcare, you got 40% paid by the government, the rest is paid by a third party, and you disconnect the consumer of the product from the payment of the product. Reintroduce competition, and you'll really be amazed at the results. I, I was talking about in manufacturing, I would have loved to have been a monopolist. But because I had to compete, my prices were a whole lot lower than I wanted to charge, and my quality and levels of customer service were a whole lot better. Free market competition is a marvel. We ought to implement more in those two areas of our economy. One more question, I guess. Who's, who's got the mic? Who wants to go? Uh, the Senate invoked the uh, nuclear option this last week. Could you provide your perspective on that being there? And do you think that's going to become the norm for nominating as well as legislation? Well, let me, f yes, I know it's been described that we invoked the nuclear option. It was already invoked. You know, Harry Reid, back in 2013, did step back, as Republicans did back with Miguel Estrada, and did a deal where we wouldn't change the Senate rules with a mere majority. Because the precedent is you only change Senate rules with 67 votes, two-thirds. That governed the Senate for 200-some years. 
And as Hannah Levy said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna challenge that, we're gonna vote with 51 votes to be able to change the rules with 51 votes. And he broke that, that is the president's Senate now. So unfortunately, you got a Senate that by and large doesn't have any rules because they can be changed by the majority at will. So I think we've got, we start, you know, Harry Reid set us down a very slippery, slippery slope. From my standpoint, you know, we say the Supreme Court. Now I know a lot of people in this room won't agree with that, but let me tell you why I immediately supported Gorsuch based on one quote. And I'll paraphrase it, don't have it completely memorized, but he was talking about the role of a judge was to apply, not alter, the work of the people's representatives. Any judge that likes all those outcomes is very likely a very bad judge, stretching for a result he desires rather than the result the law demands. How can you not support somebody who views the role of a judge as being a judge? Not a super legislator, not a judicial activist. Now, when I met with Judge Gorsuch after confirmation hearing, I was asking, him, can you give me some comfort? This is my, my first confirmation vote on Supreme Court justice. And we've seen in the past where judges tend to evolve and become super legislators. I mean, can you give me some comfort that's not going to happen in your case? And he looked me right in the eye and said, Senator, I'm going to follow the law. I've been studying it. I've been working at it all my adult life. I'm not going to change. But I'll warn you, you're not going to like a lot of my decisions. That was like music to my ears, because I know there's a lot of bad law out there, and now I go to confirm a judge who will confine his opinions to what the law says, what the Constitution says, not stretch for the result he desires. I think it's a huge step for the Supreme Court. We need more judges in courts. We need to have the, the third branch of government stay in its lane of ruling on the law, not creating, not altering. And I think if that were the case, I don't think a lot of these issues would be so divisive. I, I don't think the abortion issue would be continue to be so corrosive to the body politic if we would have worked this thing out democratically, state by state, voter by voter, as opposed to having nine Supreme Court justices decide for all of us. That type of super legislation, that kind of judicial activism has got to stop. So again, I, I was completely supportive of my final point in that too. So I know Democrats are all ticked off that we didn't confirm Merrick Garland. It was an unusual circumstance. It's eight months before an election, and we made a very simple case to the American public. And I made it here in Wisconsin. Why not have the American people in eight months decide not only the direction of the country, but the composition of the Supreme Court? We laid it out to have the American people decide, and they did. And so what we did on Friday was we just fulfilled the wishes, the will of the American public, my standpoint, the will of Wisconsin, who for the first time since 1984 assigned their 10 electoral votes to Donald Trump to make that no nomination and reelected me for the first time since 1980, a Republican senator won in a presidential year to confirm that nomination. We just carried out the voters' wishes. I can't think of something more democratic. Again, thank you all. God bless you for being involved in these, these community organizations. Have faith and confidence in yourself and the foundation premise of this nation is about individual liberty and freedom. That's what made this country great. God bless you. Say or do. So, Rotarians, if you'd please stand. 
And non-Rotarians, if you want to cheat by using this banner, we welcome you to. Uh, first. Second. Third. And fourth. Thank you for attending today. Have a tremendous afternoon.